Hi, I'm Phil Salmony, a technical consultant for Altium. And in this video, I'd like to go through the power supply distribution and decoupling for FPGAs in BGA packages. Don't forget to check the link in the description below to get yourself a free trial of Altium Designer. This is a project I'm currently working on, which is a very small M2 form factor hardware accelerator that contains a fairly beefy FPGA, power supplies, DDR memory, QSPI flash memory, and so forth, and plugs into an M2 key M slot. This specific FPGA also incorporates PCI Express transceivers. So you can plug this in, for example, to your laptop or your computer, and then perform some sort of computation on the FPGA. M2 key Ms are usually hard drives, so SSDs, very small form factor, you know, they're only about 20 by 80 millimeters, so rather small. And I thought this would be an interesting project to go through, at least in part, and pick out various aspects that are quite interesting from a PCB design and electrical engineering standpoint. In this video, we're going to look at the whole power supply network, so this quad buck converter down here, because FPGAs and system on chips typically require quite a few different voltages. If you compare that to, for example, microcontrollers, which might run off one if two voltages, this is a BGA, so we have this ball grid array, essentially all these pads hidden underneath this IC. We need to decouple this properly. You know, how do you do that if we don't have access to the pins directly on the top layer? Power distribution via planes, capacitor choices, and so on. I'm still in the process of routing this board or finishing the routing, but, this, but what I usually start with is my via placement and power distribution network. Just so I can do some sort of planning. Okay, where do my planes need to go? Where do I need to put my decoupling capacitors? And that will then in turn, of course, limit my via placement. If we look at the bottom side, you can see I've already done all of the capacitor placement. There's quite a few, and these packages are tiny. So this is an 0201 package in comparison. Those resistors down here, or these larger capacitors, are 0402. This is a fairly large pitch BGA, so the pitch or the spacing between the pads is about a millimeter. So I probably could get away with using larger capacitors but I prefer going with 0201 with BGAs. There's also benefits, of course, to the smaller package size and that decreased lead inductance. The question now is, okay, how did I come up with that I need to choose all of these capacitors and what values do I choose? Why do I place set capacitors further away and which ones don't I place further away? In addition, how do we even do this power fan out? So you can see I've got a particular way I'm doing my fan out here. And lastly, how do we then connect that up, for example, to the buck converter? with minimum inductance? How do we get best planar capacitances and so on? This is a huge topic and I'll just be touching on certain aspects in this video, but hopefully enough for you to explore for yourself and get you started. The FPG I'm using, and this video is in no way associated with Xilinx or AMD, is the 7 Series Artix. So it's the 35T version and it's a 484 pin BGA. Silence has pretty good user guides and data sheets, and I'd highly recommend if you are working on Silinx designs, and interested in PCB design, which I hope you are watching this video, is the 7 Series FPGA PCB Design Guide. And this goes over the majority of things you need to know before starting a PCB design with FPGAs, especially in BGA packages. Additionally, there's also many different data sheets you typically have to go through when designing an FPGA-based board. Here's just the general 7 Series FPGA data sheet overview. And this is the device I'm using. So somewhere mid-range, you know, it's got gigabit transceivers, it's got PCI Express support, internal ADCs, fair amount of logic cells, DSP blocks, and so on. So fairly beefy for the application I need it to be in. But let's start off with what is powering this FPGA, what voltages do we need, what currents, and so on. And that job is, of course, done by this quad buck converter and this M2 key via these pins, which then plug into an M2 key M socket provides 3.3 volts, and we need to step that down to various voltages. This is my main buck converter schematic. It's a quad buck converter, so nicely in one QFN IC, I can generate four output voltages from a single input voltage. Of course, I have my input voltage on the left here, 3.3 volts. According to the data sheet, I need 10 microfarads of decoupling at every pin. At the output, I need various different voltages. And again, I got this from the data sheet and will vary depending on your FPGA. It depends on what type of memory you're using. If it's DDR3, if it's DDR3 low power, DDR2, DDR4, that will change things. I'm using DDR3 memory. For the FPGA, I need 1.8 volts. That's for the auxiliary supply voltages. I need 1.5 volts, and that's actually for my DDR memory, DDR3 memory, and also the banks that interface with the DDR3 memory on my FPGA. 1.0 volts, which is my third supply voltage here, is for the core or the internal voltage of the FPGA. And 1.2 volts, specifically, is for the transceivers, so the PCI Express transceivers. 
FPGAs can be a bit fussy, so you can't just you know, throw all of these voltages on at once. You have to adhere to a specific power on sequence. Again, this can be found in the datasheet and will change depending on what FPGA or system on chip you're using. The recommended power on sequence, which I've annotated in the schematic, is 1.0 for the internal voltage, then the gigabit transceivers, then the PCI Express transceivers, the auxiliary voltage, and finally DDR. Keep in mind that 3.3 volts is also powering the FPGA, but of course this is coming from the M2 key, so this essentially of course turns on first. Now we know what voltages we need or have generated for this FPGA, and you can already imagine just routing that to the FPGA via planes will of course be also some sort of puzzle as well. Here we have the FPGA power and decoupling page. There are quite a lot of decoupling capacitors needed for all of these banks, so I have several banks in this FPGA, 13, 14, 15, 16, 34, 35, I have my PCI Express transceivers at 1 volt and 1.2 volts. I have all of these ground pins, which we'll see also in the PCB design. I've got these internal voltages, VRAM voltages, auxiliary voltages, and so on. Now, all of these require a certain set of decoupling capacitors. And luckily enough, I didn't have to come up with this myself. We have various different sizes. So from the smallest size being about 470 nanofarads, through to medium size, about 4.7 microfarads, and then these rather large 100 microfarad capacitors. So the question is, where did I get that from? Turns out, the answer is very simple. It's a 7 series FPGA PCB design guide, and this will exist regardless of the manufacturer. And then looking at the table of contents, recommended PCB capacitors per device, that's on page 13. If I scroll down, Spartan 7, Arctic 7. I remember this was a 484 pin device, and specifically, it was an FGG484 package, and this is the exact device we have, XC7A35T. So really nice, I've got my VCC int, VCC VRAM, VCC AUX, VCC O, and all my other bank capacitor requirements. So for example, for VCC int, I need one 100 microfarad, two 4.7 microfarads, and three 0.47 microfarads, or 470 nanofarads. All I did was take that information and put that into my schematic, like so. The user guide, of course, also tells you about what types these capacitors need to be. For example, package sizes, dielectric, voltage rating, and so on. For voltage rating, my rule of thumb is that I want at least double the voltage rating of the capacitor that this needs to sustain. So for example, if I have 1.5 volts, I want at least a three volt rated capacitor. Because as you apply a DC bias to a capacitor, the capacitance will actually drop. That depends, of course, on the dielectric used and other conditions, so temperature might change that as well. So therefore I've made a note that all of these capacitors should be X5R type and with a minimum 6.3 volt voltage rating. Especially for these smaller capacitors, so 470 nanofarads, this is actually an 0201 capacitor, so really small. It can be difficult to get these in larger sizes. So for example, getting this in a 25 volt package might be difficult. Same goes for these large 100 microfarad capacitors in 1206 packages. Getting that in a 25 volt rated variant might be really expensive or even impossible. So that actually seems to be fairly straightforward. I have some filtering requirements for, my, for example, my ADCs. And you, of course, you can change some of these bank voltages depending on what you're connected to. So for example, my banks on the left here, I've chosen to be 3.3 volts, typical user IO. Whereas for example, bank 34 and 35, I've set to 1.5 volts. And this is because this is the bank, or these are the banks that interface with the DDR memory. But again, refer to the datasheet. If we go over to PCB layout and routing, let me just show you how I go about fanning out, at least power-wise, a BGA of this type. Quite luckily in this case, this is a one millimeter pitch BGA. So the distance between each of these pads is one millimeter. That gives us nice spacing to put vias essentially between each four of these pads. Even though they might look isolated, for example, AB19 is a ground pad, and then we have Y20 over here is a, is a power pad, 3.3 volt pad in this case. We could, for example, just draw out a trace, place a via, and just do something similar on the other side, for example, like so. We need to remind ourselves what we are trying to achieve with decoupling and bypassing an FPGA. Especially for FPGAs and high performance devices such as system on chips, decoupling and bypassing is one of the most crucial elements of PCB design. We want to minimize any form of inductance in our power distribution network. This means closely spaced vias, it means short white traces and small loop areas. If I place my traces like so, and for example, put a capacitor in the bottom side, we have to span all of this distance with traces and capacitors. And we can do better. As you've probably seen, AA17 is also 3.3 volts. So I'm going to use AB19, the ground pin, and place my via and track like so. You can see I've placed the thickest possible track pretty much as wide as the pad itself. And I'm placing these vias as close as I can, of course, within the tolerances available and given the fact that I have all these pads around it. 
In this way, I've minimized as far as I can in this design the spacing between these vias, and close spacing between vias minimizes our inductance. Vias come in pairs. Similarly, on this side, I have also a ground and a 3.3 volt pair. I can place my track and via like so, and the other track and via like so. And that is the basic principle that I use when laying out one of these BGAs. Of course, I'm not using a lot of these pins here, so I have the luxury of being able to place my traces and vias like so. If I have to root out all of these designs using just three whole vias, I might not have the luxury of being able to place them that, that close. But if you can, this is what you should be doing. This pattern I've pretty much done everywhere, so in the DDR bank, it's ground in 1.5 volts, always trying to place my vias close together. If I then look at, for example, the bottom side of this pair, I have my two vias and I have my 0201 capacitor close to the vias, but not too close, and with traces as wide as this 0201's pads connecting to these vias. So I'm prioritizing using these 470 nanofarad capacitors, these very tiny packages, to go directly under the BGA, just through the vias, pretty much directly into the power pads. In the center of the BGA usually are most power pins, and we have different voltages of 1.0, 1.2, and so on, all kind of congregating in the middle. Therefore it becomes harder to place capacitors, and that's why O201s are favorable in this situation. And anywhere I can, I then place these larger, let's just call them bulk decoupling capacitors. So 4.7 microfarads is quite a large value capacitance. This is probably fine to place further away from the relevant pins. So I'm prioritizing smaller value, smaller package capacitances right at the vias. Therefore, if you extend that logic, the largest value capacitances can be further away from the IC. These are not local decoupling, they are bypassing capacitors, but general energy reservoirs. And I've placed them outside or around the perimeter of my FPGA. So on the top and the bottom sides. And these are these large 1206 capacitors, and they are perfectly fine being you know, close to the IC. Again, we want to minimize inductance. We want to make sure the FPGA or the system on chip, when it demands a lot of energy in a short amount of time, this can be supplied. And the first responders, so to speak, are these small O201 capacitors, then these larger decoupling capacitors, then our energy storage capacitors, these large 1206 packages, and then, of course, our power supply, which is this quad buck converter. So remember, if you have the luxury or if you have the space, try to place your track and via pairs like so. If we lastly then look at the power distribution coming from the regulator. So from the M2 key, we have 3.3 volts coming to the input. I've got some ESD protection and some small amount of bypassing. Then I'm digging down with a set of vias to go into my internal power plane, which is on layer five. Layer five, which is a mix of different nets, for example, 3.3 volts, goes to my regulator, which is on layer one. So this feeds the input of my buck converter. But also, of course, remember that some of my FPGA is powered by 3.3 volts. So internally, I also have to route this further along the PCB, and then any time I need 3.3 volts, I dig down with a via into my power plane, all the way to the top. Now I've had to segment my power plane because of course I have different voltages. I have core voltages, transceiver voltages, DDR voltages, and so on. So we have to make sure that from, for example, an output of our power supply, so there's our buck converter with a 1.8 volt output, I then dig down, and then as wide as possible, I try to keep my planes, of course I have to share my real estate, and then feed that to any place that might need 1.8 volts. Same goes, for example, with this 1.0 volt plane. As wide as possible, trying to share real estate, and of course divide it up depending on what current requirements you have. FPGAs are quite current hungry, so each rail could take maybe one to two amps. And then of course the same thing with my DDR voltage. The output of the regulator, 1.5 volts, power plane, on the top side, I have my FPGA, but then I also have my DDR IC, which also needs 1.5 volts. It's pretty much impossible, and you shouldn't route power with traces when you get into these kind of designs, high-speed designs, and devices that require a lot of current very quickly. If you were to route your traces and not use planes, you would increase inductance, which means you would get voltage drop it drops when you have large current spikes. And also, the planes, because they're sandwiched in the center, Layer 5 and layer 4 is an adjacent ground plane. Layer 4 and layer 5 form parallel plate capacitors, so to speak. Even though this capacitance might be very small on the orders of you know, tens of picofarads, if even, this will help with really high speed power delivery. Remember, we had 470 nanofarad O201 capacitors to aid with higher transient current surges, then slower current surges with 4.7 microfarads, and 100 microfarads for the you know, bulk decoupling. Similar goes with a plane. We might have a very small amount of capacitance, but planes, tightly coupled planes, are great high frequency capacitors. Also note that capacitors in packages will have frequency limitations anyway. 
So I hope this video gave you a useful introduction to the basics of BGA power delivery, fan out, decoupling capacitors, and so forth. Thank you for watching this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye.